Hi everybody, thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar. Today we're going to talk about doing a full arterial study in PadNet. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them into your GoToWebinar panel. There is a section that you can directly enter your questions and we will answer them throughout the webinar. Additionally, I will open up the lines at the end of the webinar so that you can feel free to ask your questions then as well. If you think of something after the webinar has ended, please feel free to email our support team. We have our, their email address listed on the screen here. Or you can always call our support team at 888-889-8997, and they're happy to answer any questions that you have. Peripheral artery disease is a disease in which the plaque builds up in the arteries that carry the blood to your head, organs, and limbs. Peripheral artery disease occurs most commonly in the lower extremities, leading to decreased blood flow in the legs and feet. Additionally, it does increase one's risk for heart attack, stroke, or amputation. PAD is very prevalent. Eight to 12 million Americans do suffer from peripheral artery disease. One third of smokers that are over the age of 50 will have PAD one-third of diabetics over the age of 50, and one-third of patients over the age of 70 will suffer from PAD. 75% of people with PAD also have heart disease, and there is over 30% mortality rate within five years. Without treatment and early intervention, PAD can lead to the following, resting leg pain, non-healing ulcers, gangrene, amputation, and an increased risk for heart attack or stroke. In terms of five-year mortality, patients with PAD have a lower survival rate than patients with breast cancer or Hodgkin's disease. In fact, recent studies have shown that cardiovascular disease accounts for more deaths than cancer, infection, and trauma combined. A typical PadNet study takes about 20 minutes to complete, and it does enable earlier disease detection by performing pulse volume recordings, or PVRs, and segmental blood pressures that are used to calculate the ankle brachial index, the toe brachial index, and segmental brachial index. The ankle brachial index is determined by dividing the ankle systolic pressure by the arm systolic pressure. The normal ABI range is 1.0 to 1.4. An ABI of less than 1.0 can indicate narrowing or blockage of the arteries in the leg, increasing the risk of circulatory problems and possibly causing heart disease or stroke. Pulse volume recordings are images that evaluate the blood flow through the extremity. A normal PVR waveform is characterized by a steep upslope, a narrow peak, and the presence of a dichrotic notch in the downslope. Now we're gonna talk about actually performing the study. In just a few minutes, I'm going to switch the screen over to Renee in our live studio. She's going to show you how to do a live test, but I just want to cover some patient preparation before we switch over. When your patient presents for an arterial study, they should be dressed in loose, comfortable clothing with their limbs exposed. Most offices will have their patient bring a change of clothing with them. Shorts and a t-shirt is perfect. If your office has gowns that they can change into for other tests, you can use those as well. We just need the patient's arms and legs exposed. The patients should not have consumed caffeine or alcohol or smoked cigarettes for at least 30 minutes prior to the test. The test does require a five minute rest period. And so it's helpful if you apply the cuffs and then have the patient lie flat while you're entering the demographic information into the software. If you're an office that prefers to enter the demographics information into the software ahead of time, that's completely fine too. 
it just tends to work out well with the time it takes to get the patient demographics and history in the software that usually covers the patient rest period and then you can start the test. During the rest period, the patient st should lie flat, not moving or speaking. I know some offices actually will dim the lights to remind the patients that this is a rest period. Renee is going to show you how to apply the cuffs on a live patient. Um, eight arterial cuffs will be used. The cuffs will be placed on each arm right above the elbow. They will be placed right above each knee, around the patient's calf or below their knee, and around each ankle. If you do um, toe pressures and waveforms, then you will also apply the toe cuffs to the patient's great toes. The PPG probe uses near infrared light to detect blood flow at the, surface of, at the surface of the skin. This provides greater accuracy when we're doing the patient's systolic pressure. So we'll be able to see how that works today when Renee does the test. The PPG probe um, can be placed on the patient's thumb or middle finger. I tend to prefer this on myself, but I know some of you use the middle finger and that's perfectly fine. In the event that the patient is missing their thumb or their middle finger, you can use alternative fingers as well. Um, the PPG probe will also be used on the patient's great toe when you're doing the ankle pressures or the toe pressures. If the patient does not have a great toe because it was amputated, you can remove the piece of black Velcro from your PPG probe and you can place it directly on the patient's um, dorsum of their foot near their DP pulse. You can do that with sticky tape if you have double-sided sticky tape. If you don't, you can wrap a piece of Coban around it or anything that will allow that PPG probe to stick directly to the patient's skin. To open up the software, you're going to double click the vascular testing icon on your desktop. It's gonna ask you to log in with a username and password. Everyone in your office should have their own username and password set up. From the home screen, you'll simply click the Perform New PAD Test link to start the test. Now we will be able to see Renee enter in the patient demographics information, but we'll just go through the next couple of slides to kind of prepare you ahead of time. The first screen that opens up is going to be the patient demographic window. Anything that's required to have a red exclamation point. Um, the patient's name, address, um, their date of birth, their sex is all required information as well as their race, ethnicity, and preferred language. If a patient is a repeat patient and they've had a PadNet study before or a Venus study performed, you can quickly pull up their demographic information by entering their last name into the last name field and clicking find to pull forward their demographics. The patient's risk factors will be entered into the history tab. And Renee will show you a quick way to enter those. Um, you can simply click on the risk factor itself, and that will pull up a legend that will allow you to select the mild, moderate, or severe for that specific risk factor. Patient's height and weight will also be entered into this section. And down near the bottom, you'll notice that you can pull forward the secondary ICD-10 code, and it will actually generate a list of ICD-10 codes based on the risk factors you selected above. In this section, you can also enter in any vascular procedures that your patient may have had in the past. And there's also a section for you to type additional notes if there's anything else you need to document on this patient. The indication tab starts with asking you to enter in the patient's referring physician. Um, you can drop down the referring physician menu and choose your physician from that list. If they're not on there, you will simply click the new link next to it and you can enter in the physician's details. Down below, you'll choose the reason that the patient is having the study. Um, these are the primary indications for a PadNet study. The most common three are gonna be claudication, rest pain, and ulceration, but we also have gangrene, trauma, embolism, or thrombosis listed as well. Once you make your selection or selections, um, you will be prompted to enter which side of the body this is occurring on. If you need to type additional information, you the additional information box to free type. And down below, we have our ICD 
code generator for the primary indications. When you click select, it will pull up a list um, that matches the selection you made above. And you can choose which ICD-10 code from there. Once you're ready to start the test, you'll click on the PAD test tab. The first thing you want to check for here is you want to check to make sure that the little box next to your perform button is green. If that box is red, you'll want to check one of two things. The first thing you'll want to check is to make sure that your device is turned on. I know from experience that when you move the cart from room to room, it can be really easy to forget to turn it back on. I know that sounds silly, but it happens a lot. And the other thing you might want to check is to make sure that your USB cable that connects your PadNet device to your laptop is plugged in securely. Sometimes, for whatever reason, it, it gets removed, and that will also cause a red box to be next to the Perform button. Once you turn your device on or you plug your USB port back in, 99% of the time, that light will turn from red to green. It just takes a couple of seconds to switch back over. Once you see the green light, you can click Perform, and you're ready to start your test. At this point, I'm going to switch over to Renee in our live studio. She's going to show you a full PadNet study from start to finish. And today we're going to be walking you through a full PadNet study. Renee, we're, um, we're unable to hear you. I'm sorry. There Can you hear me now? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, so what I was saying, today we're going to be walking you through a full PadNet study. Uh, this study is going to meet the criteria for the billing code, uh, CPT code 93923. So what we're going to be walking you through, we're going to do arm pressures. We're going to do PBR waveforms at the thigh and calf level. And then at the ankles, we're going to do both PBRs and pressures. Uh, so that is a study that meets the criteria for CPT code 93923. Um, you're also able to do optional toe testing. And since we're probably going to have some podiatry offices or offices to work with a lot of diabetic patients, we are going to do the PBR waveforms and the pressures of the toes as well. Um, and that is optional, um, but it, it definitely gives you good information. So in the interest of time, we've already put the cuffs on the patient. Um, I do want to make a couple of recommendations about when you're putting the cuffs on. You want to make sure that the patient is uh, laying flat, uh, relaxing. You don't want them to help too much putting the cuffs on. You want to make sure that they're tight. So much tighter than a normal blood pressure cuff you would use. Uh, if you're able to comfortably fit a finger between the skin and the cuff, that's too loose. You want to make sure that the bladder is against the skin. And then you also want to make sure that the hose has not been included by the limb. Uh, if it's included, the cuff is not going to fill up properly. So um, I'm also going to show you the PadNet software while we're running through this study. Um, to start, this is the PadNet home screen. Uh, since we have already set this patient up, um, we're going to let that patient rest while we put in the patient demographic information. To start, uh, in the PadNet software, to begin a study, you click on Perform New PAD Test. Uh, now, this is the main uh, basic patient demographic information. So you need to fill out everything that has one of these red exclamation points. So really quickly, I'm going to fill out these details. Uh, the patient identification number area, uh, this can be your patient chart number or whatever number that you guys use in your office to identify your patients. I'm going to select a date of birth and then the gender of the patient, race, ethnicity, and preferred language. Uh, one thing that I want to mention, there's this box right here. Uh, if you are testing a patient that is under, or under 30 or over 100, you do have to check this box to go on with the study. Uh, the reason that that is there is because patients that are under 30 uh, generally don't have PAD, so that would be very rare. And then with patients over 100, um, at that point, they probably have some sort of calcification or some sort of blockage in their artery, so it's just really expected. We're going to put in the office or the address of the patient. 
and then also their city. Uh, and then you're also able to put in the rest of the demographic information, but for uh, time-saving purposes, I'm only going to fill out everything with the red exclamation. Um, and then over here on primary insurance, uh, you, you will select the primary insurance type here. And then for our purposes, I'm going to select, select uh, self-pay. Now from the patient demographic page, we're going to go to the insurance tab. And as you see, um, if you had selected an insurance type, this is where you would fill out the information on their primary policy. And then if they have a secondary policy, information right here. Now from the insurance tab to the history tab. Uh, this is the history of the patient, uh, both the risk factors that they exhibit and any associated diseases they might have. And this information is really good for the vascular specialist who's going to be interpreting the study. Uh, it'll give them a better picture of the background of the patient. So um, under the risk factors, uh, you have two options. One option, if uh, you want to select from the drop down right here, you're able to do that. Uh, otherwise, as Nicole had mentioned, you're also able to click on the um, risk factor itself. And then this is going to give you the breakdown of what we consider the severity to be. So for example, if you don't know what um, mild, moderate, or severe diabetes would um, include, you would be able to select that right here. And then from here, you're able to click either mild, moderate, or severe to populate that drop down. Okay, great. And then the same with associated diseases. You're able to either click from here or just click from the drop down. Uh, below, here's the BMI information. You can put this in, it's inches and pounds. And then after you've made selections um, under risk factors and associated diseases. To populate the ICD-10 code in the study, you need to click Select. And then uh, based on what you've selected, it will give you, uh, it will either give you recommended codes, um, or if none show up there, you can go over to All Code, and it's going to give you a list of all the codes that are included in our Pebbit software. So in there, you'll be able to make a manual selection. OK, great. So uh, from risk factors, we can go to Vascular Procedures. And here you can add any, any vascular procedures that patient might have had in the past. Uh, again, it's really good information for the vascular specialist to have. And then under notes, um, there are these two boxes. The top box is for notes that or messages that you can leave to the, uh, for the vascular specialist based on the patient. Um, a, good, a couple good examples would be if you had, if that patient had any contraindications, it would explain why you wouldn't test a certain part of the patient's body. Um, and then the smaller box here, that is for messages that you can, uh, or no, so you can leave specifically for the patient. So uh, when that study would be printed out, if you want to give a copy to your patient in a follow-up visit, then you can put a, a note there for the patient to have. So that's history. Um, from his, the history tab, you can go to the indications tab. And this is where you're going to select the primary indications. So the risk factory, uh, or the risk factors are the history of the patient. The indications are what's going to get you paid for the study. So these are the primary billable indications. So under indications, you're going to select the referring physician. And then you're going to select one or more of these primary indications. And then aside, um, of course, with ICD-10 codes, they're pretty specific, so you do need to select the locations. And then just like in the risk factor tab, after you have made a selection here, um, you are going to have to go to the bottom under coding and billing, and click select. And then uh, this one has a recommended code. We're going to select that and save. It's going to populate the ICD-10 code. Now, uh, this is that's the end of the demographic information. Um, we're going to go on to the PadNet study and begin. So uh, we went over the PadNet test tab. As you can see, next to perform, there's a green light there. So we're going to click perform to begin the study. Now, um, at the system self-calibrates every time you go to use it. Uh, so what it's doing is the pressure inside the DTU is meeting the pressure of the surrounding atmosphere. Uh, so it self-calibrates every time you turn it on. Now, uh, right now, it's gonna, it brings you to the PadNet map. And this is where you're going to begin the study. You always begin at the right arm pressure. 
Uh, these red pressure or these red boxes are for the pressures, and then these blue boxes are for the PBR waveforms. So uh, to begin the study, anytime you are doing uh, a measurement, you're going to make sure you plug in that cuff. And then anytime you're doing a pressure, you want to make sure that you're also using that PPG probe that Nicole had mentioned. Uh, the reason we use the PPG probe during um, pressure testing is that it's going to make sure that the system and the measurement uh, are, is taking a much more accurate measurement. And the, re the way that it does that is that the PPG probe helps to detect the return of blood flow. So it's telling the DTU when to record that um, systolic pressure. So I'm going to plug in the right arm cuff. And then I'm going to take this PPG probe, and I'm going to attach it to the uh, thumb of the right hand. You want to make sure when you're doing arm pressures, you are using the corresponding hand's thumb. And when you're doing any pressures on the leg, you're going to use the corresponding big toe. So I'm attaching this to the medial part of the thumb, the pad of the thumb. And then using the Velcro to stick it securely. And then I'm going to click on that right red, right arm red box to start the pressure and click start. Now, as you see, the system is seeing some uh, waveforms from the pressure, uh, from the PBR, or sorry, the PPG probe that's attached to the thumb. So since you can see that, we're going to hit yes. And then the system is going to start pressurizing the cuff. When the system is taking pressures, it's fully occluding the limb. So it's going to pop up uh, pretty tight uh, so that the arm is occluded and it's going to slowly release to calculate the systolic pressure. And then as you see, the PPG probe, uh, this is what uh, measurement the PPG probe is taking. So you can see here there is no blood flow getting to the hand. And then uh, you start to see blood flow returning. So um, once that pressure is finished, you're going to select where you see the return of the blood flow. And then you're going to hit done. Now based on where you selected on that, uh, on that wave, that's where it's going to calculate the systolic pressure. So once that's calculated, we're going to hit save and next. And then the software is going to take us to the next one that we need to test. So we're going to be doing a right or a pressure on the left arm. So we're going to make sure that we attach the hose from the right arm to the left arm. And we're going to take the PPG probe and move it to the, the left finger. So I did the thumb for the, the first arm. Um, I'm going to show you how it, you would use it on the middle finger as well. So you take the middle finger, and then you're going to place it against that middle segment, and then attach the Velcro there. When I hit start, now as you can see, again, the PPG Pro is seeing that pulse. So we're going to hit yes, and then the D2 is going to start pumping up the air into the left.
going to be great. Now, uh, again, the PPG firm is showing you where the blood flow is returning. You're going to make a selection there. Hit Done, Save, and Next. Now, from the pressures, we're going to move on to go doing PPR waveforms on the way down. <coughs> so we're going to take this hose, and uh, this heifer is telling us to go to the right above knee. So we're going to connect it to the right above knee cup. Now, since it's a PVR waveform, we do not need to, uh, to move that um, PPG probe because you only need to use it when you're doing the pressures, not PVRs. When you're doing a PVR waveform, it's going to partially include the leg, so it's not going to pump up as tight as it would with a pressure, um, but the bigger the cuff, the more time it takes to pull up the cuff. Okay, great. So as you see, there's a waveform that is showing up on the screen. Uh, because this waveform is a little bit tall, I'm going to change the gain so that it fits the screen. Uh, you only want to change the gain, though, if for some reason it's too large. Uh, so what I'm going to do, as you see, the, the patient moved, and that's why the waveform looks that way. So we're going to wait until it um, settles down a little bit. Now, what you want to do is you want to stop the software when you have two to three identical waveforms. So as you see, these waveforms are generally the same size and height, and they look very similar. Um, if you can fit three waveforms on the screen, that's great. Um, if you can only fit two, that's fine, but you do want to make sure that you have centered them. They look the same or generally the same height. We're going to hit Save and Next. Now, with the left above me, uh, since we changed the gain on the right above me, uh, we would need to make sure that we change the gain to the same level on the left above me. Anytime that you stop the study, you can start it up again. Uh, I did not move the hose, so I'm going to move it from the right of that knee to the left above knee cap. I'm going to click to start, and it's going to start over. And I already have it set to 0.5 gain. Um, even if the waveforms on this leg weren't too tall and they fit on the screen, the reason that you want to make sure that the uh, both sides are set to the same gain, is that um, not only is the interpreting physician going to be looking at the height of the waveforms, uh, but they also want to compare it side to side. If you have one, way, uh, one leg that has waveforms that are really short, um, and you have another leg that, or another side that has waveforms that are really tall, uh, because there's that difference there, um, that would suggest that there is a difference in blood flow between the two legs. And this is something that would concern a vascular specialist and be interested in the patient coming in for further testing. So um, I'm going to stop because I can see two identical waveforms. I'm going to center them. And I'm going to hit Save and Next. Now the software is telling us to go to the right calf cuff. So I'm going to take the hose that is attached to the left above knee. And we're going to attach it to the right calf cuff. Right, and I'm going to hit start. And since these cups are a little bit smaller than the above knee cups, it's not going to take as long to slow down. And since the waveforms are above the screen still, going down to 0.5, we're going to go farther to 0.25. Okay, great. So these fit the screen. There are identical waveforms. We're going to stop. Uh, they are centered. So I'm going to hit Save and Next. And I'm going to move to the left cap row. Now again, since we changed the uh, gain on the right cap uh, to 0.25, we are going to change the gain on the left cap to 0.25 as well. You always want to make sure that the gain is the same on both sides of the leg. Or both legs. Okay, great. Okay, 
save and next. Now we're going to do the right ankle PDR waveform. Again, moving the hose from the right or the left calf to the right ankle. We're going to hit start. Then again, these waveforms are over the screen. We're going to change the game. And then once you see the identical waveforms, we're going to stop. And then um, after you stop the, the waveforms, you center them. As you see, the, the software is going to automatically select the bottom and the, the top of the waveforms. And this is going to uh, calculate the amplitude. So as you see, the, the amplitude is calculated right here. So these, we have selected two identical waveforms, center them, uh, the amplitude is calculated. We're going to hit save and next, and then move to the left ankle. We're going to hit start. And uh, one thing to mention, the, the software on our newest system that we're doing the study on, it auto-calculates that amplitude. Um, if you're using an old system, like a PadNet Plus, uh, this is, or that software is going to make you um, manually select the amplitude. So you do that by clicking at the bottom um, and the top of the identical waveforms, so one of them at least, and that would make these blue lines show up and calculate. But uh, with the, the newer software, with the newer systems, it's going to auto-calculate the amplitude um, and make the selection on its own. Okay, great. So after we do the ankle PVR waveforms, it's going to make us do the ankle pressures. Now, um, since the hose is already attached to the left ankle cuff, we don't have to move that. But since we're doing a pressure, we do have to move the PPG probe. Because anytime you're doing a pressure, you're going to use this PPG probe. So I'm taking the PPG probe from the left arm, and I'm going to attach it to the left big toe. As Nicole had mentioned, you can either attach this with the Velcro, or if you have a toe that does not fit both the Velcro and the toe cuff on the same, uh, you can take double-sided tape and then stick it to the toe. I'll show you it that way with the other toe. Okay, great. So we're starting the study. The PPG probe sees the pulse in the toe, so we're going to hit yes. Great. We're going to click where we see the return of blood flow. We're going to hit done, save, and next. And then move both the hose and the PPG probe to the right, uh, right ankle and right toe. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to do this one with double sided tape. So you take the Velcro off of the PPG probe. And then you're going to take the tape. Take a pretty decent sized piece. And then you want to make sure that the part that you are sticking to the PPG probe does not get your fingerprint on it. You're going to go across. On the light sensing portion of the PPG probe, you're just going to stick this to the pad of the tail. Then I'll hit start. As you can see, the PPG probe, it sees the pulse of the toe. So 
the, the tape does work. We're going to hit yes. And then the system's going to start pumping up the radio. Select where you see the return flow file, hit done, save, and next. Now, uh, as I mentioned, normally this is where you would end the study. Then uh, this is all you need for the 93923 reimbursement. Um, but there are times when you would actually want to uh, take the toe pressures and the PBR waveforms. Um, a lot of podiatry offices like to do it uh, just because you're working a lot with the toes. Um, a couple of other good times to do it is if you have diabetic patients or patients that have calcification in their arteries in the ankle. Um, when, when calcium builds up the, in the ankle, it, it's going to calcify it. And when that happens, when you're trying to take a pressure in the ankle, you can't constrict those vessels. So um, it's considered non-compressible. Uh, at that point, the uh, ABI is uh, it's raised and raised to a point where it's, it's false and non-diagnostic in that measure. Uh, so when you, when you have that, uh, you can do the, the toe pressure because those vessels are a lot smaller and it's a lot harder to calcify them. So you can usually still get a TBI, uh, which if you can't get an ABI, TBR, TBI is necessary for re reimbursement. Okay, so we're going to do the toe pressures and PBR waveforms. So as you see, it is telling you to start at the right toe pressure. So we have the PPG probe already attached to the right toe. So we're going to take the hose and we're going to move it from the ankle cuff to the toe cuff. And we're going to hit start. And the PPG probe still sees the toe pulse. We're going to hit yes. Toe cuffs are a lot smaller than the other cuffs, so the testing, uh, toe testing is pretty fast. Uh, if ever you aren't exactly sure where the uh, where you see the blood flow returning, you can always click can't return uh, can't see return a signal, um, and then it's going to automatically populate that information there. So I'm just going to skip this one. We're going to do the right toe PBR waveform. And you're just going to wait for the PBR waveforms to settle down. And as you can see, now they're more identical. We're going to stop. Uh, there are two that are centered. And I will let you know that when you're doing the PBR waveforms of the toes, uh, the waveforms are generally going to be smaller. Um, and 
if you have a really cold room, uh, you want, might want to warm up the patient's toes before you take the PVR waveforms and the pressures, uh, just because with the uh, with the cold, the toes um, are very small, the vessels are very small. They're going to constrict even further when it's cold. We're going to hit save and next. We're going to move to the left toe for the PVR waveform. So I'm going to move the hose from the right, the right toe cup to the left toe cup. We're not doing the the left toe pressure yet, but I'm just going to move this uh, PPG for a while down here. And we're going to hit start. And then again, just wait until they settle down. And they look identical. You can stop it. You've got two full waveforms on the screen. We're going to hit save and next. And it's going to do the left toe pressure. We already moved the PPG probe, so we're good to start. There's a pulse present. Okay, great. And then you'll select the return of flow, hit done, save, and next. Now this is the end of this study. So we went through a full cabinet arterial study. Uh, this meets the CPT code for 93923. And then we also did the toe and the ankle or the toe PVRs and pressures on top of it. Um, just to show you what that looks like. Thanks, Renee. We're going to go ahead and bring this back to our slideshow now. Okay, so as Renee mentioned, the toe pressures are optional. Um, I do just want to talk a little bit about them for a few minutes because I know that we do have a lot of podiatry offices on the line, and this will be beneficial, especially to you guys. Um, doing the toe pressures is beneficial for your diabetic patients. Um, it's also beneficial for patients with non-compressible ankles, as Renee mentioned. If your patient has non-healing toe ulcers, you may want to do a toe pressure so that you can evaluate the blood going into the feet. And any patients that may be surgical candidates that you want to check their, their blood flow before performing surgery. The toes should be kept warm, um, and you can do that by leaving on loose socks if the patient doesn't have tight socks on. You can leave their socks on while you're doing the rest of the test um, and then remove them right before you do the toe test so their toe doesn't have time to get cold, especially in the summer months when you have your air conditioning on. Diabetic patients especially will have toe, um, cold toes and that can make getting the pressures difficult if the toe is cold. The other thing I would sometimes do is place a light towel or if the patient had a, a sweater with them over their feet while I do the rest of the test. Um, just to make sure that their feet are kept warm. When you apply the toe cuff on the great toe, um, you want to make sure that it is not being placed as tight as the other cuffs are. You want it loose enough that you can spin it around the toe. And it's helpful if you have the clear tubing facing the medial side of the body. Um, that's where I find you get the, the easiest reading on the toes. If you have a patient um, with a shorter great toe, Sometimes it's difficult to get the toe cuff and the PPG probe on the great toe. It is helpful if you remove the Velcro piece from your PPG probe and stick the probe directly to the great toe with double-sided sticky tape. 
um, not having the Velcro on the PPG probe does free up a lot of space, so then you can fit both the PPG probe and the white cuff on the great toe. After you finish your test, you want to check the test signed button on the PadNet test tab. That will add your signature to the PadNet study. Um, after that, you're going to go to your home screen and you're going to send and receive your test. You're going to go to the send receive test link. This is going to allow you to send out your test to your reading specialist. It's hard to see here on the screen. I know it's a small screenshot, um, but you will see the number of tests that you have ready to be sent out. And right here, you'll click the send sign test button. You don't have to do this after every single test. Some offices, if you're doing a lot of tests throughout the day, they like to wait to the end of the day to send them out. That's fine to do that as well. After you send the tests out, um, the system will perform a quick backup. You definitely want to make sure that you let that backup run. It just takes a couple of seconds. That's the only way that you're ensuring that your tests are being backed up to our secure cloud. If you're not sending your tests electronically and something happens to your laptop, there may not be any way to get those tests back. So you definitely want to make sure that you're using the send function and you want to be sure that you're letting that backup run. When your interpreted tests are ready to come back into your system, you'll see that um, in the same window, the send receive test window. Um, the, section, the second option here um, shows you how many tests you have waiting to come back into your system. Again, I apologize, I know it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but if you ever see a number there, you want to click Get Scored Tests, and that will bring those interpreted studies back into your PadNet software. Those interpreted studies will sit here in the interpreted folder over to the left side of the screen until you look at them. Here we have the three codes that you can use to bill your PadNet testing. The first one is 93922. The 93922 consists of um, the ABI or the TBI plus the PBR waveforms at the ankles or the toes. That generally reimburses around $100. The 93923 is the test that Renee just performed. And that includes the ABIs or TBIs and the PVR waveforms at three levels, the above knee, the calf, and the ankles or the toes. And then we have the 93924. Um, this normally pays around $150, and that's doing um, the full arterial study that Renee just did and the post-exercise testing. We do have um, a PadNet super bill that we've created that I will send you after the webinar. Um, I'll just pull that up here so you can see what it looks like. This super bill up at the top has um, a reminder for which modifier you should be using when you bill a PadNet study if you're the one performing the test. We also have suggested bill amounts for each of the CPT codes. And below the CPT codes, we have a list of the most commonly used primary diagnoses to get a reimbursable study. These are not all of the diagnosis codes that you can use. I'll send you that full list as well. Um, but these are the ones that you're gonna most commonly come across. We also have our 93965 CPT code, which is for the Venus study. And these are the most common vein codes that you'll use for that. Again, I will send you all a copy of this as well as a full list of our primary indications for both um, PAD testing and vein testing after the webinar is over. We are now offering um, free Axelum certification. Um, we do offer a one-year initial term at no cost. Um, in order to get your Axelum certification, you do have to attend a training. And the training can be a one-on-one -on -one training session. It can be an attendance to this webinar. Or it can be somebody that views the recorded webinar. After you attend or watch the training, you do need to pass an online examination. And we do have a study guide um, before you take the exam. You do also need to submit 40 studies for evaluation within the first 90 days. And that is per technician. That's not, not per group of technicians or per office. It's per technician. Um, to qualify for the no-cost one-year renewal, um, you do need to keep up with performing 10 studies per month. 
Um, the Axon certification, normally there was a fee involved for that, um, but right now we are offering it at no cost, so if this is something that your office is interested in, please let us know and we're happy to get you set up and going with that as soon as possible. Now we did have some um, questions come in throughout the webinar, so I'm going to address those first, um, and then if anyone else has any additional questions after that, I'll go ahead and open up the lines for a few minutes and you can get your questions in. Um, the first question that came in is, I don't have a, PPC, a PPG probe, where can I get a PPG probe? Um, the older PadNet devices did not have the PPG probe. Um, the PPG probe was introduced with our new device. And the PPG probe provides additional accuracy for the systolic pressures. Um, we do have upgrade opportunities available if you're interested in, in that. Please let me know and I can put you in touch with somebody. Um, do the hoses need to face a certain way? Um, the hoses don't need to face a certain way, but I do find it, it's easiest if they're facing the outside of the body, and I kind of like to have them all pointed downwards just because that's easier for me when I'm connecting and disconnecting the hoses. As Renee mentioned, when she did the live study, you do want to make sure that the patient is not laying on the hose at all. Um, so if I point them all outward, then I know that the patient's not laying on any of them. Can patients sit in a reclined position is the next question. Um, the patients should be as, as, recline, as um, flat as possible. We do want our patients um, laying down. If your patient complains of vertigo symptoms when they lie flat, you can place a pillow behind their head. Um, that does help alleviate some of their symptoms. Uh, the next question, um, can all patients over 70 get a PadNet study? Um, no, the patients do have to have a primary indication to get a reimbursable study performed. Um, so again, I will send you that list of primary indications. All of your patients over 70 should get a questionnaire. Um, I will also attach the questionnaires just in case some of you don't have them or ran out of them. Um, but the questionnaires are just a short series of questions that your patients can answer about symptoms that they may be having. As long as they check at least one of those boxes on the questionnaire, then they can get the study performed. And again, all of your patients over 70 should get the questionnaire, um, and then if they check off one of those boxes or if they already have a primary indication, then you can build a study. Somebody else asked um, if we will be having a similar vein um, webinar for the venous testing. Um, we do have a vein webinar on our YouTube channel now, um, and we also have training videos on our YouTube channel now that do cover the venous testing. You can also find them on our website but we will absolutely be doing um, a Venus webinar as well with the live studio training. And the last question I have here says, is there a specific way to apply the PPG probe to the thumb? Um, yes, you want the PPG probe, the camera side of the PPG probe to be on the fat pad side of the thumb. I find it helpful when I'm training offices to, to tell them to place it kind of where the thumb print is. That seems to be, um, the best way to explain it to people. Um, you want it on the fat pad side and you want it up near the top of the thumb, but remember that we can't let any light in, so we want it as flush to the skin as possible. So putting it kind of where the patient's thumbprint is um, seems to be the best. I'm just gonna go ahead and unmute everybody now in case anyone has any questions that you did not get submitted. Wait, she wants to be. Do I did. Please keep in mind, if you did mute yourself, I can't unmute you. So if you are muted and you have a question, you'll want to go ahead and unmute your microphone. And I'll just leave the lines open for the next minute or two in case anyone wants to jump in with any questions. For those of you that don't, um, thank you so much. And I will send you that email um, by the end of the day with the attachments. Oh, we just had another question come in. Um, do the blood pressure cuffs need to be put on in a certain position? Um, when you're applying the blood pressure cuff, you do want to make sure that the bladder side of the cuff is the side of the cuff that's being placed against the patient's skin. And the cuff does tell you that, um, which side should be applied to the patient's skin. But as far as the way the hoses are facing, no. Um, you just want to make sure that the bladder side is, is the side that's being placed against the patient's skin.
and we had one more question come in. Um, this question states that not all of the users in the office are able to log into the program or have user IDs, I assume. Um, how do you go about getting those set up? You can call our customer service department. Um, I'll flip back to the first slide so everybody has that phone number. Um, we can absolutely help set your users up. There are no um, individual licensing fees involved. I think that was part of the question as well. So we'll just go ahead and get your new users set up for you. Um, likewise, if you ever have somebody that needs to change their password, we can help you with that as well. This video um, was recorded, the webinar was will also be given to you in the email that I send your attachments to. Again, if you think of any questions after the webinar is over, please feel free to email our support team. Um, it's support at biomedics.com. I believe you also get my email address with the webinar invite, so you can feel free to email me questions directly if you choose as well. Thank you so much for joining, and we look forward to providing more of these educational webinars. Thanks so much. Thank you.